Got it. Cool. All right, we're going to be asking this question. Is the citizen developer story a fairy tale? A lot of you maybe have some exposure to that. Uh, Gardner says citizen development is an end user who creates a new business application using development and runtime environments sanctioned by corporate IT. But like unicorns, centaurs, dragons, do these citizen developers for BPM only exist in analyst fairy tales? Or do you actually find real ones out in the wild making their own applications? Do they actually exist out there? Now, there may be a lot of good reasons that you have when you think about you being very skeptical about whether citizen development is to be taken seriously in the world of enterprise BPM, or is it just some kind of marketing language? It's reasonable to assume that citizen development is just, just that, just talk, and there aren't actual people developing and managing their own processes. A lot of reasons for this. One, the technology is just too complex. There's simply too many variables, objects, notations that we've been talking about, moving parts required to make legitimate BPM easy enough for citizen development when it comes through. A second reason is that functional business heads just don't understand BPM practices, principles, and terminology well enough to be able to build and manage all of their own functions and, and the things that they need to do that actually work in enterprise environments. Third, in order to make a platform that caters to citizen development, you would have to make it considerably limit the BPM capabilities that are a part of it, removing key features and functionalities that make it really unsuitable for enterprise environments. And fourth, the citizen development model may work for startups, small businesses where budgets are low and, and people fulfill multiple roles, but surely no enterprise would trust their critical processes to such a simple and simplified platform that's out there. Well, at KissFlow, we follow the philosophy of a computing pioneer, Alan Kay, who we just mentioned earlier, who said this quote, simple things should be simple, complex things should be possible. We like this quote so much, it's up in our, our wall in our big office, it's there. So let me walk through this. What do we mean by that, and how do we apply that to BPM? So at KissFlow, we actually are big believers in citizen development. We think it's not, pos not just possible, but greatly needed, especially in the enterprises. We built a no-code platform that makes it possible for citizen developers to really exist. So how do we do it? First is that, yes, the technology is complex, but that does not mean the UX has to be. So KissFlow's entire platform is drag and drop, no coding, no notations, no on-site consultants required. We focus heavily on making the design look perfect. Second, uh, teaching citizen developer how to use our platform along with core BPM practices and principles is much faster and easier than forcing them to be forever reliant on programming consultants or platform experts. Third, our platform does not skimp on advanced BPM features and functions. <clears throat> Here you can even see a real-time uh, microservice API call being made. Our forms have 19 field types. We auto-populate databases, make integrations, and auto-calculate fields. We've also got complex branching features, conditional tasks, uh, custom SLAs, incoming and outgoing APIs, advanced task assignments that we're going to look at later, like round robin, least loaded, and custom actions as a part of the drag and drop workflow creation that's there. And no code doesn't mean that the runtime has to be stripped down. Runtime forms can be customized to look like any form possible. Uh, with images, rich text, adjustable field sizes, colors, locations, and, and much more can be built in. Not to mention not skimping on reports as well that are essential in the enterprise environment. We've added multiple layers of tabular and, and graphical pivot reports on all data, along with deep anal analytics and insights that are brought in as well. Now, to answer the question about small versus big teams, you know, it's true that small businesses do love our platform. Uh, they find a lot of value out of it, but it's not just for small teams. Enterprises around the world are also seeing the value of putting the power of BPM into the hands of people at the edge of the enterprise. So there's one large toy manufacturer that has over 1,200 licenses and is putting all their shared services processes onto KissFlow. They've trained all their department managers around the world on how to develop and run their own automated processes in KissFlow in order to move them to other platforms as well. Uh, McDermott is a large oil and gas giant. They have more than 5,000 users on our platform. They use KissFlow to help IT get over their backlog. And I love this quote, KissFlow is so easy even my mom could do it. Another one of our uh, big enterprise customers, uh, RB, one of the top consumer goods in the company, has trained their citizen developers on how to create and run highly complex workflows. They have a complex write-off system that must be approved by many departments, funneled back into their existing ERP system that lacks these kind of native workflows that are there. So citizen developers, we feel like, are not mythical creatures. They do exist, but only when you offer 
the right environment. At KISSflow, we're committed to giving more BPM power to the people in the organization who can do the most change. Okay, so one of the things that uh, um, we were talking about why we need to show KISSflow, what do we need to, to say, okay, where do we exist in the environment? We don't do a lot of intense process mining. We don't do a lot of intense analytics that goes into it. Our core, core belief is that we want people to be able to make these on their own. No development experience, they just know the business really well. They know the process really well. So um, what I want to do, uh, first to give a little bit of a disclaimer, um, our CEO, uh, Suresh, was going to give this presentation, but uh, he wanted to be back in India. You may know they're having their big national elections right now. Um, so he decided to opt out of this and said, Neil, you go. Now, the interesting thing is that I am not a programmer. I am not a data scientist. I am a citizen developer. Uh, I, I lead our marketing uh, with Kissflow. So we use the, the process internally, do a lot of things. So as I explain things, I'm gonna explain it a lot from my perspective. And if you have questions about it and I'm not able to answer it, I'll make sure to get the right answer for you uh, later on as we're going through that. But uh, we wanted to be able to show you what Kissflow is like, how it works. And I wanna split up our demo into about three different parts. One is that I'll show you from the, the user perspective how it looks in runtime, uh, the different types of features and functionalities that you can bring in that a citizen developer can uh, from those angles. Second, I'll show you what it's like to build a process in the current version of Kissflow, just some really quick little things about how things are wired together and what things are, are brought in and out. But then third, I also want to show you uh, the new platform that we're coming out with, uh, which we call Kissflow 3.0. That's going to be able to show you where we're moving towards, uh, bring in a lot of the things we've been discussing in the earlier part of today, and show you how we're combining different technologies. So let's start here in the runtime, um, really being able to show you what it looks like uh, to pull something up. In Kissflow, all the applications are run on the same platform. So when a user wants to come in and uh, start a new form, uh, start a new process, they can initiate uh, any of the ones that are built. We do have pre-built processes. If people want to just go ahead and add those, basically they just go in, download it, find it, and run it. Um, or else they can do one that they've created themselves. So here we're going to look at this uh, purchase order um, process that's been run through here. Uh, this, this version of the form, which we'll show, I'll show you in the new version of how we're changing it. But it's pretty simple, but it's a, also a nice, clean uh, layout that, that users can see as they come through. Um, the different types of fields that you can use in Kissflow are being able to, uh, this is a lookup field, so a purchase order has to be linked with a purchase request. So here I can go in and go into that old one that I had, uh, the purchase order that was there, and be able to find it. Looks like I left my screen on too long. Let's see if these are coming up too. All right, we'll just do a quick refresh. Okay, so here I can go in and I can find the previous purchase requests that have been completed inside Kissflow and select which one of them I want to map to this purchase order that's here. Um, we also know that you know, processes, uh, the workflow often needs to be a lot more adaptive than certain uh, ones allow to. So here we have user fields where you can select who's going to actually be the approver on this item. You can use this one or you can use some automation uh, databases to be able to select who's going to, to receive it. Now, all basic form types are there that you can see in. Uh, also, we, we connect to the vendor information in terms of this is going to connect to a database that's there. So by selecting the vendor name that I want to supply this PO, it's going to auto-populate all the other fields as well uh, to be able to bring those in. All these are going to be set up um, over here in our masters uh, column, where it's basically our data sets that we have. Again, it's all inside the platform that people bring in, in the same place. Uh, here's an example of a table that users can create pretty easily uh, to be able to add different items that go in. So anytime they want to have a multiple thing, this one's going to go to approved items that have been re requested and, and given out. Uh, so here I can add some of the things. All these things are going to auto-calculate, uh, figure out what the total is, and put it in a, a PO total. Obviously, simple stuff for what you guys are used to, but for a citizen developer to be able to see these things, like, wow, okay, this is very easy for me to configure, and I'll show you how we do that. Uh, this field is a third-party remote lookup field that we have, where we're actually doing a quick call uh, to an API provider um, on this one's a 4x uh, amount. So what's the conversion rate between dollars and pounds right now? This is quick as just clicking it in. It's going to find the conversion rate. 
and it's going to show that purchase order now in, in pounds if you want to bring it in. So in all these ways, again, our philosophy, even the name of our product, KISSFLOW, is all about keeping it as simple as possible. But keeping in mind that quote from Alan Kay that we also want to be able to make complex things possible as we bring it in as well. The user at this point just has to submit it, and it's going to go on to, uh, to follow the workflow, which I'll show you what that looks like. Here again, uh, we can control which fields are shown, hidden, uh, read-only, editable uh, in different ways. Uh, one of the, the unique features here, too, uh, a lot of users, they just want to see, okay, what's the workflow that's coming up? Uh, they want to know where is it going, where's it been so far, tracking these things. Obviously, we're helping it in the reports and being able to pull those things out. A lot of citizen developers, even though they want a digital form, they still want to be able to make a printout sometimes. So adding in uh, print functionality to show what the workflow is, show how much has been actually brought in and what's finished on, at different moments in the workflow. Thinking in terms of a citizen developer, you, they, they make the workflow, but they always know there's going to be a lot of exceptions they want to be able to run. And they don't want to have to code all those things in all the time. So we wanted to make that easy for them, make that possible to do. So if I'm here looking at this uh, request I need to approve, I have lots of different options I can do at this point. Um, I can reassign it to somebody else. I can choose somebody else in my organization that should be acting on this item. Uh, I can get clarity, which just means I'm going to ask a quick question to somebody else who's already been in part of the workflow, um, which pings them a note that goes through. Uh, I can also reject the item, which can either reject it back to the very beginning or can reject it back to any step in the workflow. So if it's a 10-step workflow, I can go back to step five pretty easily and go through. So again, we're trying to think of it from someone who's not used to BPM. How are they going to interact with these ideas? Uh, when they think about workflows, they're going to think about, yeah, I just want to go back to a single step, and I want it to be very easy. I don't have to program that into uh, what my system looks like. So this is how users... Uh, use uh, things from the, the runtime example uh, to, to show what it looks like in the, the back end side of how they're actually creating it. Uh, again, that's the, the core. If it's going to be a citizen that's going to be developing it, what is it going to look like? Here you see the, the types of fields that we have. Again, we'll show you the, the new version we're coming out with soon. Um, but this just shows the, the, little, the functionality you can bring in. Uh, this is a sequence number. Uh, that uh, PO number needs to be auto-assigned that brings in. So it's just a simple uh, concatenate expression uh, that the user can use to, to build in something. <clears throat> There's also a lot of other uh, fields that we want to be able to show in terms of we talked about looking up uh, into a different process. This is a whole field just calls look up. We're going to choose data from this process that's running right now, that purchase request process, and just choose which field it is. And immediately you're going to be able to be able to pull those things in, uh, show which fields are, are shown in that way, and so users can select the one that makes the most sense for them. User fields to be able to sh choose that approver that we saw uh, coming down pretty easily, as well as here's another lookup where we're actually connecting it to another process, uh, this vendor registration form. So when somebody registers uh, a new vendor, it's going to be updated into this, and it's going to allow for someone else to use that vendor as a part of the process. Uh, the tables are pretty easy to configure as well. They're just additional fields that they can add in uh, to be able to pull things through. In this case, we're actually uh, doing a, uh, connecting to one of our master databases. So this one is going to approved items for purchase, which I'll show you what that's going to look like over here. Again, it's a very simple thing where you're just telling the citizen developer, just host your data here, uh, connect it in. You can do imports and exports pretty easily to be able to make those connections that are there. In terms of uh, defining the workflow, again, the idea is keep it as simple as possible. So we totally got rid of any kind of BPM in. Like, we didn't want any notation in there at all. We wanted to be able to think about how the citizen developer is going to think about the process as it goes through. Uh, they can control who starts this, this application. Um, adding steps in the workflow is just as simple as just a click. You can also, if you're wanting to uh, drag and drop these things around, they're pretty easy just to pick up and go to a different way. Uh, this here's an example of a way we wanted to bring in a little more complexity in terms of adding some features. Uh, this is a, an action that's going to come in that's going to update an item. So whenever we want to update the vendor as a part of the process, if it gets past this level, then that action is going to come through and it's going to actually update what's going on. There's a lot of other actions we can add in. Uh, we can send emails, start new items. 
update items uh, using webhooks. We really encourage uh, most of our, at this point in 2.0, most of our uh, citizen developers to, to use a, a third service party like uh, Zapier to be able to make those connections to create their webhooks on their own. We have a lot of tutorials that help them to do that. In our new version, we're actually going to be using those inside the product itself uh, so that they don't have to make those on their own. Uh, making these uh, parallel branches to be able to see what's going on through, uh, making them conditional to know it, should it happen or not based on a certain value. Again, the, the concepts should be pretty simple that, okay, yeah, I only want these to happen in, in one situation, but the key is how do we actually get the citizen developer to see that that's exactly what they w want them to do without having to go through a large training program to figure those things out. Um, so that was big for us and to be able to, to see how these things should come through, to be able to quickly see when th something's gonna fire and when it's not gonna fire. Permissions is just where they're going to be able to configure the, um, the level of visibility of what's gonna show. So things can be editable, uh, read-only or hidden if the formula would either hidden or visible uh, that'll come through. And we can figure this for every step in the workflow. So each step, the citizen developer's thinking through, okay, what does somebody need to see in this way? as it comes in and out of the workflow. And then it's just as simple as publishing it and, and getting it out there and getting it in front of people. Uh, making these edits is very quick, very simple. Well, once they get it out there, it publishes and immediately it's available for everyone in their, their team. They can get instant feedback on whether it's working or not. So that was the big, building these principles in of, of rapid application development. Just say, hey, put it out there, iterate it, keep going back and forth, back and forth. And again, it's meant to be outside of IT. It's meant to be something that IT approves. It's a cloud service. So KISPO is totally built on the cloud. Um, but we want developers to be able to have some very minimal amount of training and be able to go in and create their own processes as they, they come through and not be reliant on somebody else to wait uh, to figure out how to make these changes. So um, this is the ver version that's currently out there. If you go to kisplo.com and try it out, this is what you're going to be seeing. Uh, later next month is when we're going to actually release the, the new version of the product. Um, now, there's some changes that I want to reflect some things that happened earlier that we talked about, specifically Jim's session where he talked about combining technologies. Uh, and we talked about how it seems like every product out there is adding workflow to what they're doing. We're trying to move in the opposite direction. Um, and the opposite direction of what other uh, vendors were talking about earlier in the sense of we're starting with workflow. We're starting with what we feel like is a really quality, solid workflow product. Let's make that a little bit better, but let's actually lean in towards more the collaborative side. Let's lean in more towards the content side. Let's lean in more towards the, the unstructured side uh, of how things can go. So we use the term digital workplace whenever we talk about what we're doing. We're still committed to the citizen developer, to someone who can basically say, look, we can help you manage your processes, but there's so much more to what you're doing than just processes. So again, trying to think through their perspective about what they're trying to accomplish. So, uh, this is the look that we have for the new version, uh, what we're right now just calling KISPO 3.0. It's the third major version of the product. What we want to do is to bring in three main parts uh, of, of what's going on right now. First is understanding that there's a lot of unstructured, just collaborative talk and chatter that needs to happen to be able to manage work that goes through. And that citizen developer, whoever is managing that department, needs to be able to have those conversations and also act on those. So here's an example of just a, a channel that's going on where we're talking about things. Uh, this is a real live um, channel we use inside Orangescape. Uh, we're being able to share things, talk about things, uh, post images, polls, discussion topics uh, that need to be there. People can comment and, and respond and reply to things that are going on. Uh, in the roadmap, these are actually going to be converted into tasks as well. When you're having a conversation about something, it's like, yeah, we need to add that to this project, or we need to add that to your task list. It's going to be just a quick button where you're going to be able to click it. It's going to be able to add to what's going on in your system as well. Now, this is extremely unstructured conversations that are there. But there's a, an element that we haven't really hit on in, in, uh, in Kisflow and in BPM in general, which is these, these unstructured tasks. You're almost talking about adaptive case management or project management that needs to get in. So we wanted to be able to say, okay, citizen developers, we're not just here for BPM for you. We want to be able to help you manage those things as well, but also in an intelligent and simple, uh, but also possible way. So we're adding the idea of uh, being able to manage tasks with Kanban boards, uh, being able to see what needs to happen um, 
to, to also build in some automation to these things to say, okay, if it's going to be in, in one stage of the process, it can move, it can shift in where it's going. But it's also something that people need more control over. They say, okay, I, I like the idea of processes, but I need more control over that. So we're saying we're not going to necessarily change what we're doing with processes, but let us offer you another platform with the same principles in mind uh, to be able to uh, just take these cards, uh, drag, drop them, reassign them, figure out what needs to happen uh, with these ideas that come through. Then last, let me show you what we're doing uh, in terms of the processes that we have. So here's uh, the same idea of processes that we're, we're actually running inside Kisflow. The same thought that we're, we're trying to apply here um, is that we, we felt like our forms were, were good, but they weren't quite excellent. And we want to be able to give a lot more of a what you see is what you get type idea. So bringing in the, the ability to really customize exactly what your form is going to look like, to sort it around, to make changes. Um, these can be color coded. Uh, these can be the size of different things can be changed. I can add a, a big rich text field up here to add images, uh, to put the company logo, different ideas that need to come in uh, in that way. We've also added a lot more fields. Um, people wanted ratings, uh, sliders, uh, this aggregation field to be able to add those tables uh, easily. So all the things you saw in Kissful before are already here, but then also being able to, to add in this additional functionality that comes through. Uh, workflows are look very similar uh, to what they did before. We have kept that model of just saying, look, this is that kind of falling down. This set needs to happen first and being able to assign these things. We added a little bit more functionality in terms of uh, being able to uh, assign, uh, choose the assignee from many different sources, but especially uh, the advanced assignments that we can have here in terms of if you're going to assign it to several different people, um, do all of them need to uh, approve it, do only... 50% of them need to approve it. Do just a few of them need to do it. Also, the idea of, of round robin, saying, okay, I got four people that need to do this, but I want them to kind of do it in a sequence uh, to pull that through. And then least loaded helps us to be able to, um, to say, okay, if I also have four people that need to do it, but I only want to give it to the person who's most able to do it right then, they have the least amount of items assigned to them at the time, which kind of helps in a manual way and in a kind of systemized way to be able to bring those ideas through. For us, our, our permissions, uh, so another thing that we talked about earlier, too, in terms of integrations that can be built in, we, we did kind of take the best practice of removing some of the integrations out. We were noting that they're going to happen here. Um, so this, at this stage, I'm actually going to uh, be building in a, an email that goes out or an integration with another platform that comes through, uh, which I'll show you in a, a different model. Our permissions are, are look very similar in terms of we really want that, that citizen developer to see exactly what that form is going to look like for the person that, that needs to do it. Publishing the, the app we also wanted to make super quick. Uh, so our publishing of our 2.0 takes maybe 30 seconds to 45 seconds to really publish an app even from the first time. Now we're talking about three to five seconds at the most uh, that people are going to be uh, pulling in through. Um, last, I'll just show you a few things in terms of how we uh, run these um, integrations that come through. Uh, again, we're building out a lot of these features, but if I'll, I'll show you just a quick. A lot of times we want to create things in Google Drive to bring it in. So these are different integrations you want to do. Sending data, receiving data, scheduling actions that need to be there. Again, the whole idea is we wanted to beef up a little bit of the functionality inside what we're offering from a BPM aspect, but we have to make sure that it always looks great for the user. It looks great and is very intuitive, easy to run. Uh, I do all, most of the documentation uh, for Kissflow, and I always push back against the product guys and say, look, the product has to be the documentation. They should be able to just look at it and know exactly what needs to happen. Um, so that's our, our citizen development model that needs to, to be built in to how things come and how they work through. Um, also adding just a little bit more functionality in terms of reports. We always had tabular reports in, in Kissful. That was always an easy thing to build in. Um, but now we have a lot more things in terms of uh, we can add pivot charts. Uh, these are the charts that would be here. A lot of different chart types to bring in uh, to basically build any type of thing you want, heat maps and, and different ideas to, to come through with things. So. This is uh, where we're moving towards. We're about a month away from launching uh, this, but we wanted to show it to you, everyone in this room, just to say, you know, in terms of what Jim was saying, combining technologies, BPM 
no code, and now we're kind of moving in a, a different direction towards uh, these collaborative tools, towards these project management tools that are out there that are adding, that are actually moving our way. We want to be the first to say, look, we know workflow, we know how to do this, let us also bring in these other elements to bring them in. So that's uh, the demo of what I really want to show you. Uh, I will definitely take questions, but again, I apologize if I don't have the right answer, and I will make sure to bring those back and get that to you. So, yes. Thank you for sharing. Uh, it's a very interesting product. One question, I'm not sure, it might be a little bit technical though, is about permission you mentioned. Mm -hmm. All this UI that's generated, is it generated on a back end or is it like a front end technology? In the sense that how the permission authorization work works with who has access to this? So as the, as the creator of that, that process, I'm the one that's setting everything and then the, the user sees a difference, so but I may not. What I mean, the enforcing, I know in yeah, the UI yeah. you could do that, but through the UI may not be, able, but imagine I'm a bad agent, I uh -huh. could go make a REST endpoint and get, grab the data. Right. I wonder whether you guys kept into account how, not just a normal citizen, imagine like someone sure. in the, on, the, on the cloud go and grab the data. So yeah. what are, how you enforce this permission? Good question, I don't have the answer to that one. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you had a question. Just be loud. Um, what do you do with, with testing? So mostly when you have process running in production in the yeah. enterprise, you cannot just change the process while running live. Yeah. And That's been actually one of the, the biggest barriers uh, for enterprises to jump into Kissflow has been that testing environment. They want to be able to have a place where they can just kind of make their experiments before they, they go live in those situations. Um, so that's, that's on our, like, roadmap in terms of like that's the next big release after 3.0 comes out is we want to release these testing environments. Uh, so at this point, we kind of encourage them to, I mean, duplicating the process is pretty easy. So best practice right now is that you take the process, you duplicate it, you run those tests to see what happens, then you apply it back to the main one. But that's not the long-term solution we want. Thank you. Yes. There's probably other more advanced strategies that you could implement. Um, so, I mean, let's say a customer has that request, is he able to kind of extend this himself or, or is that something that you would try and gather that information and try to implement something to offer that feature as part of the platform? Just wondering about the extensibility of the platform itself. Sure, extend it in, in what ways would you imagine? Well, yeah, so that, I mean, there's like a feature that might not yet be available that sure. he wants available. Oh. Do they have capabilities of extending the UI themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, UI, no. That's something that we limit. But uh, a lot of our customers build their own, mostly in terms of building their own APIs to be able to address the functionality issues or bring in additional information into their processes. But UI doesn't change. That's one of the limitations of no code being able to, to hold it like that. Any other questions? Uh, one more. Yes, so for the language you showed, showed you want to be this simple when you write the branches. What kind of language people write to access the variable fields? Is it like a made up language or uh, so expression language basically? Um, like even here, if I want to change like when like a condition, right. um, the formula is just going to be, um, it's going to call up all the fields that I have in mm -hmm. the form and Name equals Neil. Okay, yeah, this is like equal, for example. Like if you are things, you would say is equal or is equal, equal. That's what I'm saying. Is it a standard <laughs> language or you just come up with your own here? Uh, mostly it's something we just uh, came up with. We, we try to apply a lot of Excel principles. So we assume that if somebody's deep into um, Excel, citizen development's probably not too I far see. from where they are. Okay. So most of the functions and features are Excel features. Okay, thank you. Thank you.